What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Masters of Sport, and I'm here with my two-time co-author of the year, Earl Kunkel. Earl, hello. Hi, Dane. I'm here with uh, the third most successful coach at Garage Strength. <laughs> um, Wait, I want to tell you a story. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, I was making reels for Instagram, and I had Tamond and Legend and Jake in a group chat and I made a yeah. really good reels and I sent it to him and I did I tell you this? No, I'm listening. And I said I was like, Hey, don't worry guys, like I'll just keep coaching people the world teams and the Olympics and I'll make the best reels too. And so, so like thirty seconds goes by <laughs> and Jake puts in one of the reels that he made that has like three million views on it. <laughs> and he just puts that in there and then like to monitor legend like highlighted it i'm like damn it <laughs> good yeah it was pretty funny don't o get overconfident yeah i just i thought it was good yeah but with the new updated stats what are these new updated stats well so like Taman hasn't been do here as long right yeah but in his time the amount of volume he's put out so it's almost like relative versus absolute strength where your absolute <laughs> numbers are higher his relative numbers are far superior his entire system was set in place oh man here we go again. he's a cog in the machine <laughs> oh my goodness i can't believe I, that's why you're number three yeah, you got that, the bronze that's, that's third true. place buddy <laughs> yeah. that's where you're at second loser not even the first one yeah <laughs> and trevor's been surpassing you now for years <laughs> <laughs> like even his young throwers are catching up real He's fast. Have, they have indoor states this weekend, yeah. so they they have a chance to. At, I think there could be two state champs that that we have. Wow, that Trevor would have. Yeah, there there. It's like one of those where there could be two, and there or there could be none. Well, but if they if they're they'll probably do well. well. Yeah, yeah, they'll do well. Dane. We went and saw Tool together. We did, yes. We saw Tool on How was that Sunday. experience for you, Dane? Um, so at first it was really bad, but I'm coming out with a victory. All right. So I'll give you the win on that one. Yeah, so Earl experienced a, a full-blown Dane panic attack. I wasn't going to talk about that, but since you brought it up, now I will. Well, I think it's <laughs> important. I, I think it's important because it, it's funny because I, I brought up to Taman and Legend and Mason – and one of them doesn't like heights. Okay. And I, I, it might have been Mason or Taman, maybe. Like, I don't think Legend cares, but they related to the feeling that yeah. I had. And so I also think it's important to talk about this stuff because everybody acts like they don't have, like, they're in, invincible. I do too. But it's not my place to bring it up. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. your place yeah, to bring uh, it yeah, up. Yeah, I agree. Because I like, like I think the reason why I'm bringing it up, I feel, is that, dude, I, I don't, I'm not embarrassed. It's, it's a, it's a reaction, and I yeah. think that that's important for people to know. Like, it's okay that that these things happen, but while you're in the moment, it's really hard to slow things down and get your mind to like get normal. Yeah, I had the I was talking to you and I was like, I don't want to say anything to like trigger, trigger him to more. make it worse. Yeah. And I so like I was asking I, I said that out loud to you. I was like, yo, I don't wanna say anything that like makes it worse and you're like well, I think you talking to me is helping. I'm like, all right, I'll just keep talking Dude, to him then. The f the one thing I want to pat myself on the back to to give myself a, a little bit of an excuse is Caitlin the first thing she said when she came out of the bedroom like she woke up when I got home late uh -huh. she was like how was it I was like yeah it was great and then she's like your seats looked like they were so high and I was like yes at least I have somebody on and then I told her yeah. and she's like oh whatever um I think it was like uh I, I guess I'll, I'll share what happened is that I, I've told Earl that when we drove up Pikes Peak is a mountain in in Colorado. This is when you were on vacation with your family, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And this was the first time where I really had a panic attack from like heights. And I looked out the the car window and we're at like 13,000 feet and you start to notice you're getting short of breath and I looked out the window and I'm like, dude, if if I open this door, I'm falling off the cliff and I'm dying. I don't want to open the door and I start to feel like I'm going to do it. So I jumped in the back of the car while the car was driving. I wasn't driving. And Lincoln's looking at me like, dude, what the heck's my dad doing? <laughs> See me act like an idiot. There, 
and my wife's uncles telling the story about how pilots do that sometimes after they wake up from blacking out while they're flying. Oh, wow. So he was like, dude, it, it, it happens quite a bit. And I'm like, oh, cool. You're telling me this while we're at 13,000 feet. And these pilots are flying at like 50. Like, yeah, I'm real tough. Um, so that was the first time no I ever had that. travel for you, Dane. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll know. <laughs> <laughs> You're terror locked forever. <laughs> then the, the second time was when we were uh, at the Olympics, actually. We were on the top floor of the building that we were in. And, like, the first day, Alex and I, Alex Rose and I were standing there, and I, like, looked out, and within, like, five seconds, I was like, I'm going to jump. Dude, I think that stuff. So I'm like, I got to get back. And I'm, like, up against the wall, and I started crawling, and he was, like, dying. So every time we'd walk past the balcony, he, like, teased me, but he would also feel bad at the same yeah. time because he's, like, you know, it, it sort of sucks. What's funny is Dane's a big guy. Alex is a much bigger monster, guy. total monster. <laughs> yeah, like he would grab me, like I'm gonna throw you. No, nah, I'm just kidding. I feel really bad for you right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna throw you. <laughs> no, I remember when I met Alex and we started talking about anime and manga. And yeah, you were just like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Proceed. He, well, uh, yeah, Alex just actually was talking to me about how he's going f- hardcore magic right now. Anyway, the gathering. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Um. So, because I, I had told them the whole story, the. With Tool, it was like, I sort of thought I had this feeling when I walked out the first, like when we first came yeah, when out. Yeah, we came out into the like yeah. the arena, if you will. And I was like, well, I, we'll see. When I sit down, I'll be more comfortable. And then as we got up and I turned around, as soon as I turned around, I I, I was like, oh, my God, I got I to gotta sit down. And I just, I was literally like, could not move. Yeah, you were, you like kind of sprawled out because the seats were open. And you put your hand over your eyes. Yeah. And it was like looking down. You were doing one of these, like so, looking down. So the. the I it's almost when someone does something embarrassing yeah, around yeah. you and you're like trying not to like look at them as I couldn't look scolded. I, I couldn't look out into the arena. Yeah. And so for me, it was like going through, like, why am I thinking this? You know, it's okay that I'm feeling this way. And then I, and then I go through, like, it's, it's okay I'm feeling this way, but how, how likely will this happen? And it was like a 20 to 30 minute battle. I mean, it, it might have been longer. I don't know. You, you expressed, like, you let me know what was going on maybe like three minutes in. Yeah. You I were like, to, I'm I feeling to. this way. I was like, all right. And then when I asked you to move, when you moved yeah. to my other side, that's when I started to, like, feel good. Yeah. I w- that's because I protected you from the outside. <laughs> you were like, I'll protect you uh, yeah. from the stairs. I was like the rook coming in and, like, <laughs> shifting the king on over for you. I was like, I got this, buddy. And so I think it's like a. I, it's weird because if if I go up on a ladder or even like my my parents' roof, not that their roof's that tall, but like yeah. I hung up all the Christmas lights. I was laying on my chest and like I hung the Christmas lights. I didn't feel bad, but it's it's something like maybe it was the open space. It might be the open space and the magnitude of the height. Yeah, and that grade is steep up there too. It's steep, but it's like. I mean, dude, the thing is, there's people that are afraid of heights. So it's like, yeah, I get it. I, I I wouldn't say I'm like perpetually afraid of heights. It's like just specific triggers. So um, I I felt similar. You know, I've had I've had a, a a fear of flying as well. So it's like, dude, I know I'm not like the most maybe mentally stable with with um, anxiety and fear. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about things that go high up in the air. Well. Things that are in the air too. Yeah. I mean, I've had panic in the past over. Um, I but mean, you, I, you've gotten really good with flying, though. Like, yeah, flying doesn't bother me, dude. Actually, this last when we took a when Jason and I and Jake went to knees over toes, both flights or the flight down uh-huh. and the flight back, they were turbulent the whole time, uh-huh. and like. The flight down was actually to the point where the guy never took the seatbelt off. And I was, I actually acknowledged, I was like, dude, if this was me three, four years ago, I would have been blowing a gasket. But I was just sitting there like, I'm chilling. Like, and that's where I have to give myself like a pat on the back. Another one? Yeah. Two of them? Yeah, two. Way to go, buddy. So I think it's, a, I don't know. I think the lesson is like, dude, it's like, don't hide when you have those emotions and, and try to, try to seek some way of if you're with a supportive person i actually equate it to if you if you ever did 
psychedelic drugs it's very important to understand like what your ego can do yeah and it's like getting and it's and it's like being in a comfortable situation in, in those situations knowing that you have someone trustworthy i got you there uh, no i feel good i feel like i got patted on the back not by myself no i hate you all right <laughs> i believe you too <laughs> you we didn't we didn't even talk about we, the show, dude. I freaking yeah, nothing I think, about the show. I th- I think you described it the best, where you said it's Tool is like a, I would say it's like a heavy psychedelic jam band. Yeah, it's a hippie jam band, but they're playing like like you said, heavier music, and they're yeah. riffing off of like Middle Eastern Indian type of ragas and stuff. Like yeah, just using those drum patterns and those rhythms, and yeah, it's enjoyable that way. We didn't even talk about how we struggled to get into the parking lot. Oh, yeah. Geez. How we went on 95, what, like three times, yeah. like circling around. Drove an extra like 23 miles. Yeah. <laughs> Making jokes the whole time. And though. then and then finally got in, <laughs> parked far away, which is fine. Wasn't yeah, that, we're wasn't fitness. That yeah. Like, <laughs> you <laughs> you just like, walk. This is what you do. You're a fitness influencer, Dave. You have yeah. to park far away. Yeah, you walk. But it came back and paid off because we exited the parking lot within yeah. three minutes because some random gate opened when we were. And I put an over under on like I think it was like forty, 40 minutes before yeah. we're out, and it was like three minutes gone. I was like, "Whoa, I'm getting home way earlier tonight." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Dane had work the next day. I did not. Yeah, that was. It's I can't do it. I can't believe I used to do that stuff in college like all the time. Yeah, all the time. But I think. Uh, when I was reflecting back on the music side, what I brought this up to you a little bit too at the show where it's like their ability to play so tight. You know, you always look at musicians, like at least I would always look at musicians like, yeah, they're really good. They practice a lot, but you don't truly grasp what they're doing because you don't, I'm not a musician. Yeah. So I can't really relate to them. I, I played, you know, t- the tuba for 12 years, but like tuba I did. It was a cool instrument. Yeah. It's, it was great. Actually, and John Philip Sousa died in Reading here. Oh. Yeah, it's a little, uh, and he, you know, he's a he invented the sousaphone. Anyway, um, dude, the sousaphone player in the Roots. When I saw them live, like later, like I forget at what year they brought the sousaphone player in, but like the low end just became so much more like, woo, yeah. like it was wonderful, way more thumping. <laughs> yeah, I think though, comparing it to like it's such an art. It's just like a weightlifter who like you look at Lasha snatch and yeah. it's like it's so smooth. Well, it's smooth because of the work he's done, and there's no noise. There's no, yeah. There's no noise to his movement. Same if you watch, you know, Tom Brady, or, or and it's and and you watch these these guys. You watch Tool play together, and they're just on a different wavelength. Yeah, that their drummer, what's his name, like Danny Carey. Yeah, he he's like sixty, Dude, and he, he I, was like his upper back through his arms was like he was jacked if yeah. you would like he lean. looks good. He wasn't like bodybuilder big, but it was like lean and like yeah. muscular, like and, and fast. Just, like, yeah, and then he he can count to like four like all the time, and Th- probably like seven and nine. But that's, you get what I'm saying. That's what yeah. That's where it's like watching someone like I mean all of them. Yeah, and any musician who's put in the time, right? When you see them, it's like wow, this guy's just doing stuff that it 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 it's literally for me mind blowing. Yeah, and I think that when you appreciate sporting movement and and knowledge and and effort, and I, effort's probably the main thing, and just the work when you see them, and then as a group for them to unite all that stuff together into this cohesive like presentation. Yeah, I didn't say this to you, but I said it to other people. I was like, "Hey, I wanted," to, and they were like, "Oh, how was it?" I was like. Well, the one thing that kind of surprised me was I knew it was like a four person band and like one was a, you know, vocals and the three instruments. And I thought like when you listen to them on record, I'm like, there's a lot going on. Right. So I thought when we would go see them live, they'd have like additional touring musicians, two or three guys in the back, yeah, like just doing other things just to fill out what they do. And it there wasn't. Yeah. And the sound was still like full. full. Yeah. It was very full. uh, That impressed me like. I think too when they were playing, they never they never stayed on. It's funny because you you'd feel like they they lengthened like bridges or pieces of a jam, whatever it might be. They yeah. lengthened it, but it was never to a point where you were like, "All right, let's get to the next let, let's get to the next kicker here." It was always like 
they would they would pull it just right and then it would back off and then the next thing would come in and yeah. you're like, oh wow that other thing that you were listening to ended already but it had it had transitioned you so well to this next step right good dynamics in yeah. that band yeah very swell composition too i like that i i was wondering when he came out and did it for the encore and he did the drum solo yeah and he used like that drum machine thing i, I was like is that an analog synth the he two has? the two drum the, yeah I, that's what i was trying I to think figure it was out. some type of i don't know but i thought it was some type of analog synth that he was like programming things and would do it and had like a I don't know. I bet I can find out on the internet. Well, that's what uh, was, that was another question I had is like they're programming that and he's programming that and he already has another he he already has his full solo laid out off of the program? I don't think so. I think he did the solo right into the thing and then I think he just started playing along with that as like a backing track. Okay. Which I thought was really impressive. Like you ever try like he was playing to basically a metronome. Yeah flawlessly and it's right. like dude you sound like a machine like you literally yeah. sound like a machine the way you're playing and he's just doing it at the yeah. drop of a hat and just to something to relate to that quest love would always talk about when he was in the studio and he was playing the drums he just wanted to sound like the drum machine he wanted to be so spot on and it wasn't until jay dilla started saying like eh. yeah so th there's this function you can use on like drum machines or anything programming that will like sync the beat up so it's like just it's a machine, right? right it doesn't right, right. miss. It's right on. And Jay Dilla was like one of the first people to be like, I don't know if I need that. Yeah. And yeah. Like let yeah. it slide out just that little bit. Yeah. And like. Like a human error. Yes. Yeah. And got Jay Dilla or got Quest Love to start. To consider. Yeah, yeah. Even though like he was human trying to be the machine, which is impressive in itself. And like. I think it's just, I don't know, the wiring of these people. Dude, it's just anybody. Anybody at the. At the Anybody at that level, uh, yeah, it's just like, dude, you're the crazy. You put the work in, you, yeah, and you achieve the talent from you, the work. Yeah, you put work in, you achieve a skill, and you achieve a skill that you love, and that that's why you put the work in. And it's up to us to just clap and applause yeah, yeah. at all the gracious. <laughs> Everyone you, uh, plays uh, drums and sings, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's up to us to just. You asked me that while I was there. You're like, why does everyone clap when something happens? I was like. I don't know. Everyone plays drums and sings. That's all I had. <laughs> it's just an acknowledgement. You're awesome. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about muscle building. Specifically, let's talk about biceps and triceps. Since you wrote like three books on that, or is it only two? Well, three if you count Book of Swole. The book, we'll count it. Three. Yeah. Book of uh, Buys and Tries, Volume One. This is before you had such a great co author, even yeah. if you had co authors then, too. Yeah. No, I didn't have any co author. Yeah. Only Caitlin editing it slightly. Yeah. Um, so I have Bison Tries 1, Bison Tries 2, which is a whole nother book, and then yeah. Book of Swole. So, yeah. yeah. So I want to talk about biceps and triceps. But first, I want to talk about when you talk to people not in the fitness normies, right? Yeah. Non-fitness people. And you're, they're like, how are you strong? And they're like, show me your muscles. It's, yeah, flex it's your biceps. It's, it's flex your biceps or like right. how much you bench. Where like anyone in it, they know it's like they look at – Maybe this is just me, and you look at their butt and how big that is, and you're like, oh, wow, that's probably how athletic they are a lot of times, or strong they are. Yeah, qu I always think quads, glutes, or back. Yeah. If they've got a big, wide back or a big butt. Yeah. Or the posterior. Yeah, it, yeah it's like if that's all filled out, then you're like, all right, they're strong. Now, the bicep, though, is like, you can convince anyone you're strong somehow if you have a big bicep, right? Yeah. I could just go up and flex. Like, if you're dealing with a 12-year-old, right, people who, like, and you flex, you, yeah. they think you're strong just because yeah. you have that. And it's like, well, maybe not. You Even know, if you just flex at a 12-year-old, they think you're strong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that's what makes you ripped, right? Well, all right, biceps are cool. Like, I have nothing against biceps. When I was, like, 16 and 17, like, that was my favorite part of, like, of course, yeah. It was it's wonderful and like it builds up your head, you feel wonderful about yeah. yourself. I think it's too I think it relates to it's easy to get that it's the first muscle that you learn how to push to fatigue. Yeah. So it's really important for long term development because it's easy to contract uh to, to execute like bicep actions. It's an easy muscle to coordinate. Same nice. with your tricep. But it's it's the first movement or exercise that you can do where you're like, wow, that's 
really hard, but it's just it's the energy the the effort isn't that hard. The the pain and, and discomfort that you feel in that localized area is elevated, and it sort of teaches you like okay, that's what the rest of my body might need to feel. Yeah, awesome. If so, you're mature enough to get past right, just so the bicep, I feel bicep. like you're telling me why you should train the bicep from like a a larger perspective of like how it impacts. But why should I train the bicep from like a more specific? Like this is actually yeah, 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 why yeah. you should do it. Uh, I think I mean one, if you're in sports, you have a lot of a lot of pushing and pulling, and so yeah, this, dude, it's so funny because. College coaches, they'll always say, like college strength coaches, they'll be like, well, you're only strong as strong as your weakest link. And then 20 minutes later, they'll be like, oh, why are we training buys and tries? That's <laughs> stupid. You know, that, that's a, that's worthless. It's like, wait, you just said I'm only as strong as my weakest link. Uh, might as well make that weak link strong. <laughs> yeah, so well, exactly. It's like uh, I, I, th- I think I think there's a couple reasons why you should train, let's say, specifically the bicep. Um, one, again, pushing – Pulling. If I'm pulling, it, 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 it's gonna enhance my pulling ability. Two, it's gonna ha- it's gonna improve my grip strength. So if I'm in a combat sport, or if I'm a football player, or rugby, or anything like that, or even uh, grip grip strength uh, in baseball and grip strength for field hockey, ice hockey, the the stronger your grip is, the more you'll have control over the over the uh, equipment that you're using. So like a throwing a baseball will actually improve your control if that works for esports too now i'm curious it the speed might have to be focused on okay. a little bit more yeah um i would think it would a little bit yeah it would just go with the speed aspect a little more but you know so pulling grip strength and then you know it it's also um if let's say you have uh you know using the only you're only as strong as your weakest link let's say you're doing a pull-up and you struggle to to lock it out like really that's mainly your bicep that's going to finish the flexion of your elbow so it's like along with your rhomboid a little so it's like um to get your chest the sternum to the bar so it's like if you have weak biceps your pull-ups are going to suffer as well and then if your pull-ups suffer, then, like, your back's going to be a little bit weaker. And it's also uh, bicep strength is also really correlated to shoulder, shoulder strength, shoulder health. So it's like if I'm a discus thrower, I need to train biceps, one, because of the position I'm holding the discus in, but also we're doing a lot of pressing, so we want to maintain that shoulder integrity uh, based off of our bicep health. All right. Those are some great reasons, in my opinion, to train it. Well, how do I train it now? Like, what – I know you love bicep exercises. <laughs> yes. What are some of the, the <laughs> best ones? Like, how do I do it? How heavy should I go? Um, how often? How do okay, I train? Okay, so the bi- old standby for me is always just stupid, heavy hammer curls with a cheat. Cheat, like swinging it. Real quick, I got to stop you. I used to get made fun of because I love cheating my curls. Love it. They're like, you're not doing it right. I'm like, well, my bicep looks fine telling me I'm doing Like, yeah. I don't need to, like, go with, like, okay, so what, super slow. W- what I would Tell s- me why I was doing the right thing. Please. So you're doing the right thing because there's a, the eccentric. You can have 120, 130% strength compared to concentric. So if I'm swinging that up and then I have a controlled eccentric, okay. my forearms will blow up from heavy f- hammer curls. Okay, and you're doing that over the time frame of you know, you, I might do like heavy hammer curls with hundreds and do like a set of twelve, and I'm swinging but trying to control, and then my forearms just light up, my biceps light up, and then I might go do something like Zotman curls. So Zotman curls, I, I'll go supinate, pronate. Yeah. Okay, and that's going to really light it up even further. And that's where I might go a little more controlled because I really want to focus on like uh, the brachialis or, or, you know, just my my grip. Um, So the it's like a pre fatigue sort of an overload, like serious eccentric overload uh, when you're when you're cheat when you're doing almost like a mechanical drop set yeah too, yeah yeah, yeah exactly it would be like uh it's it's similar to even if you think about do it's also potentiation okay it's yeah you know, so yeah it, it's similar to the it's like all of these little tricks so uh, i'm hearing smack heavy heavy hammer, hammer curls. curls then go what i you know the original originally it was called the scott curl we're on a preacher on a preacher bench scott curls uh preacher curls they isolate so well those are great um, but 
dumbbells are the way to go and it's like i've got like five to ten that i always use uh hammers the hammer curls zotman curls preacher curls a movement that we invented here called the homer so you literally yeah, walk at 90 degrees that isometric movement crushes yeah. murders it, it, people it, it crushes it's i remember having friends do that for the first time like oh like let, let's just chase by like because anyone can chase the bicep like, pump. Literally And it's just like, dying. all right, here we go, 10 reps. All right, now hold the isometric. All yeah. right, you got to do 10 more. And they're like, are you serious? I, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And then you have to hold it again, and they're like, I hate you. Like, yeah, it's horrible. Everyone's blown you up. You get a huge pump, a huge pump. And then um, incline curls is another great one. Spider curls, laying on my chest, doing dumbbell chest-supported curls. Um, drag curls. Dude, I have... I mean, slam curls are more uh, performance based. Uh, Drag and, curls are fun too. Yeah, I, I, it's just the, this. These movements almost always bring in some type of shoulder, some type of lat as well, um, and and then forearm work. And it, and it, plus, if you're in a combat sport and you got decent sized biceps, I'm not saying they have to be huge like a bodybuilder, but big enough so that when you know, you're lining up, if, especially at the high school level. You shake the guy's hand. You got big forearms. The first feeling that someone gets on you is if you get a collar tie or, or like, wrist control. Yeah. And if you have good grip strength, dude, you just won a huge battle in that match. Right. I'm also thinking, like, a Muay Thai lock. Oh, yeah. Like, if yeah. you're up against the cage and, like, when you're bringing that knee up knee and you're up, yanking yeah. the head down, I don't know much about Clinch. it. But yeah, that's yeah. what it looks like to me. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, like, you're adding a little bit more impact because – because your biceps able, pulling yeah, hard, bring it in. Yeah, now you, I know there's other muscles working on right, it, but right. it but helps. But it do- definitely helps. It helps with the grip too. Man, yeah, I th- I think it's like, uh, I mean, in the in the sports performance world, I think the most underrated areas, legitimately, are biceps and the bench press. They're the most underrated, and someone might cry about this, but there's so many people who will say. Oh, yeah, bench press. When do you lay on your back? Yeah, when do you lay on your back to do a bench press? Guess what? The world record holder in the shot put can bench press close to 600 pounds. Then the dude that he beat could bench close to 700 pounds with a bench. Like, you, you want to tell me that this, this movement here has no application to pummeling and wrestling. It has no application to, you know, punching someone in when, when you're, you're playing offensive I, I line or like whatever. I feel like the bench press is done because it allows you to horizontally press yeah, and away have, from the body if you have and not have back. to hold it up with, like, your shoulders yes. as you press out. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, just, I don't want to say it. From what you said, it's like, well, use your brain. I need to be able to press horizontally. Like, I need to be able to do that. Yeah. How can I overload it? Well, let me lay on my back. Yeah. Let and me like, lay on my back so my shoulders don't get destroyed. Yeah. That's, that's all I it is. And I can isolate more so my pecs. And now, my pecs are huge muscles. Maybe. Does that movement exist, the, like, standing bench press? Yeah. We, uh, it's, it, What's it called? <laughs> we call it the bunderchuck press because Dr. B, we used to do it where you go, like, boom, 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 okay. boom. Uh, some people call it neater press as well. A neater press? Like, neater. Yeah. I think like K-N? Uh, neater no, or just N-I-E-D-R. Okay. Old-time bodybuilder. I got you. Man, I like the sound of that movement. Yeah. You should make, like, every 12-year-old who shows up start Try with that. Try and do that. Yeah. They yeah. do their shoulders will be so strong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they even used to do incline bench. It used to be without, there wouldn't be a seat. It would uh, literally just be like a plank. And you would you know, just you could bench on it. set up with your feet, like yeah. holding you the whole way. Uh-huh. I could see how that could limit how much weight you could put on it. Yeah. But again, it's like, I, I don't, I mean, I sort of understand why people talk crap on biceps. And I'm not saying that we should be devoting like two days a week to, to training bias, but it's like, there's a big benefit. They, but they the do triceps. have they tri- oh tri- triceps. That's what we're talking about next because we're talking about those swole arms. Well, that, uh, again, it's like if you have. Uh, so why are we train in triceps, Dane? Uh, uh, rapid elbow extension. Um, if you have a lockout problem in the bench, you can fix it by by isolating your triceps in specific areas. Shoulder stability. What I'm doing right now. I here, was going to say you're trying to flex your tricep right yeah, now. It, it, it's <laughs> different heads are responsible for when your when your elbow is above your shoulder versus below it, and 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 now all of a sudden, that's going to be factoring into if I'm wrestling, if I'm playing football, if I'm even if I'm uh, to a point, you know, 
maybe not so much swimming, but if I'm doing a, if I'm a gymnast and I'm doing a handstand, it's it, dude, they're, they're extremely important. Do you find that the fact that we value the size of our quads, our hamstrings, our glutes to sports performance, and we should train them all the time? And I'm not arguing that point in yeah, any way, right? But they all look at it as like this makes you more athletic, yada yada. But we sometimes devalue the limbs of the upper body, and especially from like a speed element too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, there's I don't know. dude, there's almost no plyometrics that you could find outside of like random things that I post on Instagram. Yeah, clapping push-ups. Yeah, there's the like boxes, the no upper body p- push-ups that are no upper body plyometrics. There's almost no upper body pull-up based plyometrics i had people like one of the best plyometrics technically would be for upper body would be a rope climb because you're using your body weight and you're accelerating the entire way it's arguably it arguably could be a plyometric are you talking about with the two ropes like either one and you just like donkey jumps donkey kongs uh normal rope climb even and and i had one guy who actually messaged me like what are the best can you do one for rows rowing type plyometrics so i'm gonna put something together on instagram but it's like we're so well developed with legs but not so much with with the upper body and so you know going back start walking on our hands yeah yeah exactly <laughs> uh go and, i mean think about even monkey bars like yeah they're essentially a type of plyometric oh. You're, it's explosive grip work. so when i was a kid i used to try to hang on the monkey bars until i would get calluses on my hand yeah because my dad would come home with calluses on his hands yeah, so i thought so that made you more uh manly if you will yeah having calluses and we got to the point because american gladiators were on there was like maybe four or five of us like we must have been like eight and i can't believe like teachers allowed this to happen just yeah. knowing how it is now we would hold on to the monkey bars and, and like try kick to kick other. one another yeah. off we used to do that <laughs> and like wrap your legs around and pull yeah. them down no yeah. it was exactly that yeah. and i'm just like wow i was like uh, i couldn't imagine something like that happening yeah and kids not getting sent to like the principal's <laughs> office and like you're getting suspended for fighting <laughs> i i mean that's biceps and grip so it's, yeah dude to me um going back to that to that training to the to the mindset of the 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 training is it's like we, I, I wanted to share this actually. I have a discus thrower that I train online. Who's a he's a D one discus thrower. He might, dude, he's huge. He's like six nine, huge. Oh wow! Could could win the NCAA in the discus division one level. <clears throat> uh, from the Middle East, total animal. How how are your squats right now? He's tall. The squats pretty good. It's like close to six hundred. Okay, like, <laughs> like ninety degrees. Any low bars, but he gets well, he's t- six nine though. Yeah, too. yeah, he <laughs> gets slightly past ninety. It's not bad. How much does he weigh, if you don't mind me asking? He's like 340. Dude, he's... So he's, he's like Shaq size. Yeah, he's huge. Not seven but like, feet, but that but, style. But 6'9", 340, like, you look lean. Yeah. You don't look like... Yeah, he's... he. If you see him... You don't look thick, so to say. Right. Like, yeah, you're you not fat and sloppy. Yeah. So, pulls, deadlifts close to 700, like 680. What's your bench? The bench is 375. I was like, dude, really? That's terrible. That's absolutely horrible. Now, I know he's got a seven-plus foot wingspan. Yeah. He should be benching 200 kilos for a set of four as a discus thrower. And there's, you know, there's even like Daniel Stahl, the this best ties di- into triceps. So we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel Stahl is the best discus thrower in the world has a terrible bench press, but he can still hit 200 for like a set of four terrible in the world of, be- of, of discus throwing. He's known to have a bad bench, but because of, you know, his arm length and that, that hinders him and his size, it does hinder him. He still has monstrous triceps to make up for that and if if you are a especially like an offensive lineman or or a d line or d tackle anybody like that you've got to have extremely strong triceps so i don't i think it's unwarranted i think it goes back to the hatred of bodybuilding it's like the functional zealots and and they're 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 despised for for uh for bodybuilding and i think a lot of the functional guys when they came up uh, I think a lot of those guys just didn't like bodybuilding because they didn't. They didn't. Honestly, I think some of them are pussies. Like I just don't think that they could handle it. Dude, bodybuilding's hard, so it's like they didn't. They didn't want to do it, so now that's that's how they it train burns. people. You get yeah. super winded too. Maybe it's because I like hold my breath when I'm doing. it. I'm like, why is this so hard? <laughs> why yeah. is my heart pumping so <laughs> much? <laughs> to the point where I've seen like talented young, like cross 
fit kids like training for it get destroyed by bodybuilding yeah, yeah like and it's like you literally train endurance for muscle use for like strength movements right and you're telling me bodybuilding's like it's like ruining you ruining you. like what is going on here well i get it because like everything you do in crossfit like you're co-contracting like, yeah you're never like yeah you're never just, isolating yeah when, yeah no that's that's but still i always found it funny watching like young kids started at like you you like to hurt so like you do crossfit hurts right like, right and bodybuilding nope I was gonna bring this up. Uh, ben Patrick from Knees Over Toes is so into yeah. How'd uh, that uh, backward sled pull go, Dane? Uh, I don't remember actually. No. I think there's I, video. I was of too foc. I I don't remember. I'm too focused on what I'm about to say. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. So he yeah he destroyed me. <laughs> so he he focuses on like tibialis isolation. Right. Okay. And everybody's like, oh, what a great idea. This is amazing. It's like, why aren't we thinking this with with buys and tries? Like, right. And then I'm sitting here right now. I'm going, that's why he's. That's why Ben. That's why his stuff. Like he he comes across as such a genius because he's like, dude, it makes sense. Why aren't we doing this? Like, so maybe I should just steal that from him and apply it to the buys and tries. to buys and tries. Like, dude, why aren't we training this? Jason, note that for yeah in the content calendar. he pulls out this giant analog analog mixer that dan carey has (laughs) let me put let me program (laughs) yeah that would be wonderful all right so triceps we're pushing biceps we're pulling we know we I got a sense from you, like, they are important to sports. Like, you need them to perform in sports in some capacity. Yeah. All right, let's get to why everyone actually trains, buys, and tries. Let's talk about the aesthetics Just getting big, yeah. Um, I mean, I think confidence-wise, I think it goes back to you're proud of what what you've done and and the feeling. It's like the first muscle that I think kids, you know, kids like – learn how to pose with and when you start to pose and and you start to see yourself in the mirror and you see it is zero there is zero difference from tool okay there's a lot of money involved with tool but (laughs) but outside of that the reason why they played so well the reason why they play so well is they love it and they put in the work and they love the work and they love they just love that work over and over again, and then they get applause. They get external feedback. You know, probably now their external feedback is more so financial. Yeah. But there's, I'm sure they still have a massive internal uh, reward from playing music. Training your biceps is no different. It's the first time that you get this external reward from doing work. So when you're hammering your biceps and you're lifting and then you go stand in the mirror and you flex, you're like, dude, it's getting bigger. My like my biceps are getting bigger. I can't believe it. It's working. Now it's this carrot is just dangling in front of you and you start to realize the more I do this, the bigger my arm gets and the more I realize that this work isn't wasted work and you start to figure out like this, this is that feeling is what attracts people to str- the strength world so yeah. much is that you start to understand grinding is so awesome because you see that result and it ends up being like grinding is what everybody likes about training yeah it's not like grinding in the club but like grinding in the <laughs> weight room it's so much fun yeah and, and it's funny you say that like the rewards i i once had someone who i didn't know train who in a book club i was in and we're talking like we're reading like high fantasy type of stuff so like the farthest thing you think from like who's involved type Mm -hmm. of thing with a stereotype type of view yeah and they started talking about lifting i'm like what i'm gonna listen to this conversation right and they talked about how they framed it as like video game high scores yeah 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 and like the weight on the bar was just a new high score and things like that and i was just like whoa and then they started talking about like new skins and like costumes oh it's just my muscles like finesse in this way same thing I like Zelda. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> I was just like, that's so cool. I love that metaphor. I, I think that's exactly it. I, I think that that's the the aesthetics goes back to like you you're proud of what you've done. So then you start to wear tighter shirts, and then and people people notice these things, and and that's that's it. It's like human nature. Like that guy did does something. He does work. Like he innately does work. So now it's dude, there there I'm sure there's research on this where 
um, it's the same reason why we're attracted. If 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 we are heterosexual, I am attracted to women with like breasts and and glutes and hamstrings, right? Like, and if I wow. see that's a really uh, out there take, Dane. Well, if I'm heterosexual, <laughs> you're like, yeah, that's so groundbreaking. You're a dude that likes breasts and butts. No. <laughs> but my my point is is that if I see a woman and she, my wife does. You know, single leg squats. She has a nice butt. Sorry, everybody. I'm saying this in public. <laughs> I see she's doing work. She's staying fit. So I'm more attracted to her. That's like an innate thing that happens. And it's probably the same shit when a dude is, is you know, training. They're proud of themselves. In the public sphere, there's people who, you know, male, female, who see this guy or girl and they're, they're getting jacked and they're going, dude, he's got big biceps. He does his work. Dude, I... One time <laughs> in college, I had a, a chick come up to me, a woman, and she's like, dude, your forearms are unbelievable. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> this is the moment I've been waiting for. This was for. like 300 pound day, <laughs> yeah. too, right? <laughs> like, this is the moment I've been waiting for my whole life right here. Everything I've done up to this point paid off 19 year old day 300 pounds <laughs> thanks baby That's a joke in the beer. <laughs> all right let's go to the audience questions this is one off of youtube uh harris ashraf what are the prerequisites that a person needs to have to become a strength and conditioning coach for a person coming from a non-exercise physiology background especially something like engineering also what are the standard certifications one can prepare to go get in uh, strength and conditioning uh, i mean i think if you want to do like the standard stuff you go get a cscs that would be like the standard certification i i think it's okay it's like good baseline um i think if you if you don't have like the the you know exercise science or whatever background that they pretend that you need to have I think I think you just get the CSCS. I think uh, honestly, I believe a lot in. I'm like a big guy, a big fan of like Masterclass, the app, and, and like getting courses from like people who are successful in the field. And so, I'm on Masterclass, and I I watch you know cooking videos from um, I don't even remember the guy's name. Uh, some dude who did a cooking show on Masterclass, and like just to learn, right? And it's like. I didn't go get certified, but I learned something from this person. And now you can chef a little bit. Yeah, and now I improved. And I think that's actually, you know, you get the CSCS to cover, like, the institutional stuff. But I would highly recommend getting courses from people who are successful. Yeah. And that's, like, where, you know, like, for us, we've got a lot of really good courses. Weightlifting and sports performance. We've got uh, parabolic periodization. we got sports performance bio. We have technique courses. That's all stuff that I think is very, very, very apl applicable because it's coming from someone who's in the industry, in the fitness world, and they and they know what is needed there. So I think that, you know, you, you got to look at it on two sides. It's like the institutional versus practical. Yeah, I'm definitely a practical yeah. person. My only institutional sort of training is through you, yeah, if you will. Yeah. Like, just coming, studying, learning, asking questions. At Garage Strength University. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> like, I don't want to say it. It's like... It's a, I think of more like when Uma Thurman goes to is it Pi May and yeah. she like goes and studies with him like Bill's like go learn right right like that's how I feel like it's just like yo go find the person who knows exactly and like pick their brain like what you did with uh, Doctor B too yeah, same same exact thing like you didn't get a, a certificate for that but like you got to go study with the guy who was in charge of like Russia's like strength and conditioning yeah for a year it's like dude that's yeah. that's the whole point uh, that's what that that's exactly right and. You know, just because there's some institution that accredits it, if you will, or says, like, you know, here's your knighting yeah. sword. There yeah. you go. It's like, obey your masters, dude. Kill your idols, right? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Josh Kostler. This is a YouTube one, too. What advice do you have for coaches trying to branch out of their niche? Not that I mind only working with uh, stage combatants, martial artists, and stunt performers, but it'd be nice to be able to work with other kinds of athletes. Uh, that's a tough one because it, 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 some people get, you get, um, you get a stigma, uh, you get like associated with that. So it's tough because it, it's, you've got to figure out how to break it. And that's where social media comes into play. If you want to, if you want to show off, like, 
you want to work in bodybuilding, then I would recommend you get into bodybuilding. And that's like the fastest way. You're still going to have your, your classic, you know, people um, that you're training and that's the success. That's where you have like the, the, the word of mouth. But if you want to get into bodybuilding, then you've got to get into bodybuilding. Yeah, like that's who you want to train. If you want to get into sports performance, you've got to start training yourself as in the realm of sports performance. You start posting videos of yourself doing things or whatever. And then people start to come around. Oh, you're, they're interested in what's going on. And so I think it's like figuring out, you know, you want to be powerlifting, same thing. You, you find, you find like the areas that you want to go into and you've got to use social media to your to your advantage and if you can't do those movements then you've got to find somebody that you befriend and that will that you you can uh convince them to trust you to create a program and then they become successful and then you know you guys have like a little you know you ride his coattails of, of success and be like look i helped develop this person but i would just say through social media first is that how you got here through Sam's coattails? <laughs> that was yep. true. Yeah, that's ex- that's exactly how I got here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's true at all. No, I think it's funny because you think that you you think that uh, dude. That's all I thought about every day early in the old garage at my parents was like. I'm sorry to bring up memories. If I if I don't get this kid to the state tournament in wrestling, I'm never going to get another wrestler. Then, then you know, Dakota Davis is the first kid I got to go to states in wrestling. Uh, if I don't get this kid the medal, I'm I'm never gonna I'm never gonna get another wrestler. And I just would constantly think that it was like, boom, 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 every single time. And it's like you be a you become obsessed with that. Yeah. So it's like sort of an unhealthy slash healthy way to motivate. Set big goals, big dreams, yeah, right? Yeah. That's all we got for this. That's one, all we got. So the rule of thumb here. Always be open about your uh, about your fears. Yeah. Um, communicate as well as you possibly have a can. Nice trusted friend there to not make fun of you at all. Yeah, and you always have to make sure that you train buys and tries at least four times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. <laughs>